The intent of this video is to address the evidence needed to confirm that a U-boat has sunk after an attack. This is a part 8 video of the channel's Bombers vs. U-Boats Battle of the Atlantic series. By the spring of 1943, most U-boat attacks and sinkings were from Allied aircraft rather than surface ships, as shown in this table from a declassified 1946 Chief of the Naval Operations, Anti-Submarine Warfare, and World War II report. All of the images shown in this video are declassified. The report indicates that overall, aircraft sank 5.1 U-boats per month during World War II. This value exceeds the U-boat sunk per surface ships at 5.0 per month. As discussed in the channel's Part 2, 5, and 6 videos, the B-24 and its variants sunk more U-boats than any other aircraft. An aircraft can attack submarines with either depth bombs, air-to-sea rockets, or MK-24 mines. Mark 24 mines were the code designators for an airdropped acoustic homing torpedo, also called FIDO. Depth bombs were the primary aircraft deployed kill stores adopted against submarines as discussed on this page. The aircraft will need to determine the state of the U-boat after the attack, classified as Category A through J. Category A is known sunk. Category B is probably sunk. Category C is probably damaged, possibly sunk, and Category D is probably damaged. After a submarine attack, the aircraft will radio the U-boat's position, as discussed in this Action After Attack section of the January 1945 United States Fleet Anti-Submarine and Escort of Convoy Instructions document. The aircraft will mark the location of submergence. If the aircraft does not have underwater tracking sensor equipment, the aircraft will employ gambit tactics. Underwater U-boat tracking sensors include expendable sonar buoys and magnetic anomaly detectors. Aircraft deployed expendable sonar buoys are shown in this image from a January 1943 Anti-Submarine Command Monthly Intelligence Report. An aircraft-mounted magnetic anomaly detector is described in this image from an August 1943 U.S. radar characteristics document. The aim of gambit tactics is to induce the submarine to return to the surface, and this will provide an opportunity for renewal of contact and further attack. Prior to the gambit patrol, the aircraft will spend 15 minutes orbiting the zone looking for signs of submarine damage. In estimating the U-boat's position, assume the U-boat's surface speed of 18 knots for the first hour and 12 knots after the first hour. Assume the U-boat's submerged speed of 6 knots for the first 10 minutes and 3 knots after the first 10 minutes. If the submarine lost the ability to submerge due to damage, the crew may try to scuttle the U-boat. If the U-boat's crew is egressing the hull, orbit the submarine and fire the airplane's machine guns at the crew. This act will keep them inside the U-boat and prevent them from scuttling the submarine. An aircraft cannot accept the surrender of a submarine. Moral dilemma question. Given this guidance, do you think it's justified in firing upon this distressed U-boat crew? Attacking aircraft were also to keep neutral ships away from the surface damaged U-boats by firing across their bow. If it does not back off and disengage, the aircraft is to attack the vessel. A neutral ship, however, is allowed to rescue U-boat survivors only if the U-boat has sunk. Usually the aircraft crew does not know if they sunk or damaged the submarine they attacked, as described in this page from the April 1945 U.S. Air Staff Intelligence Historical Division Report, the Anti-Submarine Command. The air crews were instructed to remain in the area until relieved by another aircraft or surface vessel. As long as the U-boat remains submerged, the search area will be minimized. If the aircraft retains some kill stores after the initial U-boat attack, the plane will drop a sea marker at the last known submarine location and apply gambit baiting tactics. The aircraft will egress some 30 miles away from the U-boat marker. The plane will orbit from 30 minutes to an hour. After this duration has lapsed, the aircraft would return and attack the U-boat if surfaced. It was difficult to assess the state of the U-boat after the attack. Let's discuss the various signs of a successful or unsuccessful U-boat attack as outlined from this page extracted from the June 1945 Military Intelligence Service Air Information Bulletin document titled Timely Tactical Topics Part 2. Depth charges give off an oily residue after explosion. Air bubbles may indicate the U-boat is adjusting its trim or may be venting its tanks. Surface oil may indicate damage of the external fuel tanks. 
Large quantities of surface oil indicate rupture of one or more of the fuel oil tanks. This indicates a close miss. None of these observations are indication of a rupture to the submarine's vital pressure hole. The observation of a continuous stream of small air bubbles is likely due to damage to the U-boat's air bottles. This is not considered serious. A U-boat breaching the surface after an attack may be due to a temporary loss of control trim and may not be serious. Large air bubbles causing a surface commotion indicate the U-boat is in trouble. If the large surface bubbles are observed with a duration over 10 minutes, then this will indicate the U-boat has likely blown its main ballast tank and serious flooding has occurred. If large quantities of oil are also visible, the captain is likely blowing out their fuel tanks to restore buoyancy. If the U-boat does not surface, it has likely lost control and will continue in an uncontrolled dive to a depth where the pressure hole will catastrophically rupture. The submarine can be considered sunk. No further surface evidence will be observed. The U-boat may be able to make repairs and escape if the sea bottom is within 600 feet. In order to confuse aircraft, the Germans adopted devices which would provide indications of a sunk U-boat. The genesis of this concept can be traced back to a September 28, 1942 meeting between Adolf Hitler, Admiral Rader, and various other high-ranking German officials, as discussed in the September 1942 post-war translated Führer conferences on matters dealing with the German Navy in 1942. Hitler provided his thoughts regarding how a U-boat could feign destruction. Allied aircraft tended to break off their engagements when they observed oil slicks at the attack sites. The concept he proposed was to have a torpedo which could be filled with oil and other material which would give the appearance of a destroyed U-boat. The loss of a torpedo tube, though, would not be considered desirable. The feigning device may be best placed on the U-boat deck or the U-boat could have oil and air blown out of its villages. The Germans did deploy these types of U-boat decoys as discussed in the German submarine bubble target section of the March 1943 monthly anti-submarine report. Most of the decoys developed were to disrupt the surface ship's acoustic sensors by disturbing the water. Some of the decoys were intended to deceive aircraft into thinking the U-boat was sunk by observation of surface oil spots and debris. The debris contained old cap bands and gym shoes. A U-boat needs to be on the surface to transmit back to BDU as discussed on this page from the June 1943 Anti-Submarine Command Monthly Intelligence Report. Many of the submarines were not likely in a position to send attack status messages back to BDU given that they were submerged while under attack. German Submarine Command would have to assume the U-boat is lost after it did not return to port but would not necessarily know the cause of the loss. So how close did the Allied claimed U-boat sunk compared to the post-war record? This page, from the reference shown earlier, discusses Allied claimed submarine sunk versus post-war Axis records of U-boats actually sunk. At the end of World War I, Allies overclaimed the number of German U-boats sunk. For World War II, Allied Anti-Submarine Command required more convincing evidence justifying an attacked U-boat as sunk or probably sunk. This table squares up the Allied claim U-boat sunk with post-war German records. The first column is the period of the anti-submarine warfare. Each period is around eight months. The second column are the dates of the period. Columns A and B represent the Allied claims of U-boat sunk or probably sunk respectively. The total column is the sum of columns A and B. The last column is the U-boats known sunk provided by the Germans at the end of the war. Overall, the Allies underestimated the number of U-boats sunk by around 6%. The 6% underclaim is likely due to U-boat losses due to sea mines, friendly fire, accidents, and other hazards. The total Italian, German, and Japanese submarine World War II losses are shown on this list. Underclaiming the U-boat losses occurred for all of the Axis belligerents. The ratio of U-boats claimed sunk versus probably sunk is very high for the Italians, medium for the Germans, and low for the Japanese. This is due to the Italians giving up easily, surfacing and surrendering, whereas the Japanese seldom surfaced, even when the game was up. Intelligence information was easier to gather from European sources, and in the Pacific theater, anti-submarine aircraft and ships could not generally orbit and stick around to evaluate the results of an attack. 
If you've enjoyed this video, please consider liking, commenting, or subscribing to the channel, World War II U.S. Bombers.